In today's video, I'm going to first cover how to build your own local music streaming server for a popular online music source that can run on something as simple as a Raspberry Pi or in a Docker container. This will allow you to integrate that service into Home Assistant or use it with other media players. Then I'll cover the building of a local touchscreen interface that uses ESP Home and Home Assistant to control that streaming server. Now while I built this project for my own DIY amp, you do not have to have the amp shown here for your own project and can use or adapt these concepts for your own needs and potentially other music sources. I'm going to cover all this and more, so hang around. Hi, and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. Today's video is actually going to be broken up into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about how to build and add your own Sirius XM streaming server to your network to allow you to stream Sirius XM content to any device that will accept a URL, and that includes Home Assistant. Then in the second part, we're going to talk about adding a touchscreen display that allows us to easily select and play some of our favorite Sirius XM stations. I do want to take just a second to give a shout out to YouTuber Dorfmeister, who provided substantial support for both parts of this video, including developing a custom library that we're going to use in ESP Home for that touch panel. Thank you, Kevin, for all of your help and your patience. Now, I will be using these with my DIY AMP project that I covered in a couple of other earlier videos. But do note that this is not the only way to use these two systems. You can use a streaming server for a lot of other purposes and may be able to actually adapt it to use it for other streaming services other than Sirius XM. And the touchscreen display can be used for all kinds of stuff in Home Assistant, and I'll try to talk about some of those along the way. Now, as always, there will be links down here along the timeline and in the video description if you wish to jump ahead to a particular part. And there will be a written version of this project that will contain a lot more information than I can show here in terms of all the code and the step-by-step -step process, wiring diagrams, parts list, and more. So check that out in the video description as well. So let's go ahead and get started with part one. Now my DIY amp has a lot of inputs and a lot of options, but the one thing it couldn't do was it couldn't stream directly from Sirius XM. And that's one of my main sources of music. So to play Sirius XM through my amp, I would either have to use my phone and stream over Bluetooth, or I'd have to do something like go to the Sirius XM desktop app and have my computer hooked into the amp to be able to play music. And this wasn't very convenient every time I wanted to switch stations. I either have to pull my phone out, unlock it, go back to the app, change stations, or go back to the desktop app and change stations there. Now, the one thing that the AMP can do, however, is it can stream directly from a URL. Unfortunately, SiriusXM doesn't make URLs available directly for their channels. However, an individual who goes by the name of Christopher Bailey uh, or Angelus Mortis on GitHub has developed a SiriusXM player and you can see the information on that here. And again, it'll just be linked to down in the video description, but this is really just a Python application, which means you can run it on pretty much anything, including a Raspberry Pi. There is one thing I want to note here. You do need a Sirius XM subscription to be able to play any channels other than the free channels that Sirius XM offers. This is not going to give you access to anything that you're not subscribed to. Also note, as he lists here, this is designed for personal use only, not in any kind of commercial environment. But he does make whole documentation available, including on how to install it. And you do note that this can be installed in Docker. And that is how I opted to install it here. But again, anything that can run Python, including a Raspberry Pi, can run this app. Since I was already running Home Assistant on Proxmox and had a couple of other Proxmox servers set up, it just made sense for me to run this on Proxmox. And I'm running this in a Docker container using Docker Compose. Now, if you've not done that before, again, check out the written guide for a kind of a step-by-step -step process. And Dorfmeister has also created a really nice video that walks you through step-by-step -step on creating an Alpine container and then a Docker Compose file within that container to run the SiriusXM app. So once you have the server up and running, and here's a copy of my Docker Compose file that I used to get it up and running. Again, don't worry about the code here. You can find that in the written description as well as my GitHub repo on my DIY amp. But once the service is up and running, it's very easy to play any Sirius XM stream. I'm using VLC Media Player here, and all I have to do is call the server IP address with the port and then pass it the ID or the channel ID of the station I want to play. Easily just clicking that will immediately start playing 
the Sirius XM station that I specified. So how do you get those channel IDs? They are different than the channel number you might be used to. Well, the Sirius XM player actually has a command line as well that you can run. It will actually give you a list of all the stations that you're subscribed to along with the ID that you need to use in your URL. And again, I show you how to do that in the written version. So once you have your server set up and tested, then it's very easy to go back into Home Assistant and add a dashboard with all of your favorite Sirius XM channels. And to be able to make those buttons work, we're going to use a simple rest command. That rest command is going to accept a parameter. Now don't worry, again, all this code is described and listed in the written guide and in the GitHub repo. But again, you'll see this accepts a station ID. So all we've got to do is for each of these buttons is to call that rest command and pass in the channel ID of the station we want to play. Then a simple click of the button will start playing that particular station. Again, this is running directly from my local streaming server to my amp. And if I want to change stations or surf a little bit, a simple click of the button will easily call that command again with the new ID and it will change to a different station. So it's a very easy way to have all of your shortcuts in one spot and be able to quickly switch from one station to another using Sirius XM and your own local server. So even if you don't have Sirius XM, you might be able to adapt this same concept for other streaming services, especially if they provide some sort of API. So you might check around on GitHub or someplace else and see if your particular music streaming service provides an API, and you can adapt this same idea to be able to have your own shortcuts in Home Assistant. But for me, adding the SiriusXM server allowed me to finally be able to play SiriusXM content directly to my amp. But I still had one problem. Before, I still had to use the phone or the SiriusXM website to change stations. Well, I still kind of have to do that because I have to go to the Home Assistant dashboard every time I wanted to change channels. So what I'm setting out to do in the next part of this video is to create a local touch display that I can use to choose and change my SiriusXM channel without using any other external devices. So the touch panel display has lots of potential uses beyond what I'm going to show today, especially with Home Assistant. You can use it to show state of entities or control entities, or even like I'm doing, actually execute scripts in Home Assistant from the touch panel. Kevin actually has a few additional examples of where he's actually controlling door locks and displaying door lock status on the touch panel display. So between this video and the written detail guide, you ought to be able to take what I'm doing today and figure out how to adapt that for your own needs if you don't have a DIY amp. And we will be running ESP Home on our ESP32, albeit with a couple of custom headers that you may not have used before in something like ESP Home. But don't worry, you don't need to be an expert C++ or YAML coder to be able to make use of this project. Now we're only going to need a few parts for this project. First, we're going to need that 2.8 inch TFT LCD touch panel display. Next, we're going to need an ESP32. I'm using the 30 pin Node MCU style. You'll see why in a minute, but it is possible to use other ESP32s. And of course, we're going to need a data and power micro USB cable. That's all that's required for the basic part of building this project. Now, there are a couple of optional parts that I'm using. Again, both designed by Dorfmeister or Kevin, so thanks again, Kevin. But one of them is a PCB specifically designed for this project. You'll see how I use that here in just a second. Now, before you ask, unfortunately, neither I nor Kevin have the ability to build, sell, and ship these items. But Kevin's graciously made the design files available for this, and there are a lot of online services where you can use that design file and get these printed for just a few dollars per board. Next is the 3D printed enclosure. And once again, the design files are available for that. I can't print and, and send them to you, but again, there are online resources or you can adapt and use some kind of project enclosure or even build something, a front panel out of balsa wood. There are a lot of different ways to do this. So both the PCB and the 3D printed enclosure are optional. I'm gonna show you both the PCB uh, assembly and also how to do this with a manual wiring if you don't want to use a PCB. Now, assembly when using the PCB is extremely easy. All you've got to do is take your ESP32, and then, again, this is designed for a 30-pin Node MCU style, which is why I'm using a 30-pin. But you simply line it up with the markings on 
the PCB, drop it in, solder it into place, line up your pins here on the display, solder those into place. But there are a couple of other notes to be aware of here. First, the pins on the display are actually kind of long. And to help support those and not uh, put pressure on those and to keep this more parallel, it's helpful to add another row of spacers in here. And to do that, I just took some pin headers that I had, used some needle nose pliers, gently pulled the pins out, and I was able to insert them here. So that will relieve a little stress on these pins and also keeps everything more parallel. But the most important part is this display comes with an SD card reader. Now we're not going to use that, but the pins on the ESP32 are actually long enough that they'll make contact with this metal SD card reader and that would be a bad thing. So the first thing I did was trim these pins off and make them a little bit shorter. Then I added some captain tape across here, but you can use electrical tape, anything to provide some insulation so that the pins on your ESP32 don't come in contact with this metal. So if we look closely, we'll see the other pins have just enough clearance here that they're not touching, but it wouldn't hurt to add some tape underneath those or trim those pins off as well. But other than that, that's all you have to do to assemble the PCB version. So what if you don't want to order a PCB or you don't want to use a PCB? Well, it's very possible to create this by manually wiring it as well. How do you do that? So all we have to do is take the design of the PCB, which you see here. So you'll see the pins used on the ESP32 on the right and the pins for the display over on the left. All we have to do is recreate those PCB traces with our own wiring. So we would wire it up something like this. It is a lot of wiring. Probably would work best if you try to use short runs of solid core wire, something like maybe 24 gauge solid core wire. Just makes it a little easier to keep the wires in place. And you might actually have to remove the pin headers on the display in the ESP32 or order ones that don't come with a pin header. But it is possible to create a wired version, as you can see here, where Kevin initially created a wired version. And again, by using short runs of solid core wire, you should be able to get something about the same form factor as the version using the PCB. So yes, this is a lot of wiring and you have to be a little careful. Also notice he still has the tape on top of that SD card reader to make sure nothing comes in contact, but you can create your own wired version as opposed to using a PCB. Now with our display built, regardless of whether it use the PCB or the wired version, it's now time to install the ESP home code. Now, a few notes on this. If you've just used ESP Home to install things like sensors and that kind of stuff, this is going to be a little bit different because we're actually going to import a library and use a header file. Now, don't panic. While this is Arduino C++ code, you don't have to be an expert in C++. In fact, the written guide to this will go through line by line and tell you exactly how the code works and what you might need to change for your own project. So I'm just going to kind of cover the highlights here. So let's take a quick initial look at the ESP Home code, as there's a few things different from what you may have normally created in ESP Home. If you've not used ESP Home before, there's a really good getting started guide on the ESP Home official website. But when you create an ESP Home node, it's going to create a lot of this initial information for you in terms of your Wi-Fi and an API key. But there is something a little bit different here. If you look right at the top of this code, we're going to import a library, and this is a special library developed by Kevin for the TFT display that's going to handle a lot of the low-level stuff for us. Really, you shouldn't need to, to look at or even touch that library. You just need to import it into your ESP home. We're also going to include a header file. We're going to take a look at this in a second, but this is where we're going to define the panels and the layout and the pages of our display. Next, we're going to include a few definitions here. For one, we're going to define all the colors we want to use on our display. And these are just definitions of uh, RGB colors. And you can have as many as you want, and you can name them whatever you want. But we're going to use those IDs of those names in the header file in just a second. In a similar manner, we're going to need to import or define font files. And this is detailed quite a bit more in the written guide, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But you can use pretty much any material design icon on your panels, or as I'm doing here, importing a couple of Google fonts uh, that just allow me to display text on my panels or my buttons. Now we'll come back to some of the rest of this ESP code in a minute, including the automations it's going to run when we actually touch a panel. But let's go over and take a look at that header file 
first. Now, before we get into the header file, it's important to understand a couple of definitions here. The display is set up so that it can have multiple pages. In my case, I have four pages uh, numbered zero to three because it's zero based, but each page can also have multiple panels. Now, a panel is an area where you see those little squares and they can be defined as touchable or not touchable, which we'll see in just a second. But to understand how the header file is going to work, just remember that you can have multiple pages and each page has its own panels. Okay, this is that header or that .h file we're importing into ESP Home. Now, don't be scared off when you first see this, even if you're not familiar with C++ or Arduino code. There's only a few things we really need to change here in terms of laying out our panels and our pages. Most of the rest of this code, we're not even gonna to have to touch. And while I'm just gonna to briefly touch on some of it here, it is detailed line by line in the written guide. So right at the top, the only thing we need to consider is how many pages we want. So we're gonna start out with the, what is going to be our starting page number, which is zero, because this is zero based, and how many total pages we're going to have. In my case, I've got four pages, but since it's zero based, my maximum page number is three. So that's all we have to worry about here at the top. Now we're gonna come down and we're gonna define the layout of all the panels we want across all of our pages. And the nice part is here, we can define this in terms of percentage of the size of the display. So if we want, in my case, I wanted four buttons, each of those buttons is going to be 25% of the width versus three rows, 33% of the width. So you can see how I'm defining the layout of this display panel. And again, this is, I've laid it out here by page, but again, all you need to do is define each of the panels that you want to appear across all of your pages. Next, once we've defined all of the layouts of the panels, we're gonna come down here and group those panels into the pages that we want. So all we've gotta do is for each page, just say which of those panels we defined we want to appear on that particular page. Now notice that for my menu system up here, I wanted the menu to appear on all of the pages. So I just simply repeat those panels on each page. So at this point, we've defined all of our panels and the layout of those panels on our pages. Next thing we have to do is we have to define the colors and the text and the font that we want for each of those panels. Now these first three, again, are my menu buttons. I'm using material design icons. I'm not gonna go into the details of how to add a material design icon here, but it is detailed in the written guide. For all the rest of the panels, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define the font that I wanna use, the color of the text, the color of the background, and then the actual text itself that I want to have on there. Now, Kevin has added a property called a tag for all of these panels. In that case, I'm gonna use this tag to specify the Home Assistant script that I wanna run when that particular panel is touched. So a couple of other notes here. Again, on text, if you want multiple lines of text, you can do that by simply separating the text with a comma that will break it up into lines. The other thing is I wanna specify whether a panel is touchable or not. So if I set this to false, it's really gonna be something that's for display purposes only. And if I touch it, it does nothing. But that's all we have to do now is for all of our different panels, we're gonna define the text, the colors, the fonts, and in my case, the Home Assistant script that I wanna use. That's really it. That's the only thing we have to change in this header file. And then we just need to save it. And then we're gonna copy it up to our ESP Home folder in Home Assistant, which I'll show in just a second. But a full copy of this version of my header file is available in GitHub, which you can take it and then modify to your own needs. Now, I did mention we needed to copy that file to our ESP home folder in our Home Assistant configuration. Now, you can use FTP or a map drive if you have that. If you don't have any of those, there's a very simple way to do it. We're going to launch our file editor. We're going to browse down and find our ESP home, and then we can simply upload a file and select the H file. Now, if you look here at mine, you'll see that I already have, here is my H file that I have. Mine's called uh, tftmonitor.h. Yours can be called whatever you want, but we just need to simply upload that into the ESP home folder under our home assistant configuration. Okay, so now let's return back to the ESP home file. Again, you can see here where I'm including that H file. If you saved yours under a different name, just make sure whatever name you saved it under is matched here in your include statement. But let's scroll on down past the stuff we talked about before. And down here, we're just defining the 
typical devices like we would for any other ESP Home device. Now do notice that these don't have a name, so they're not going to appear in Home Assistant, but we really don't need them there. When we look at the display, the ILI 9341 in this case, notice that there is a Lambda here. What that's doing is it's actually calling a function in Kevin's library to initialize that panel. Again, not something you need to worry about. You can just put this code directly into your ESP home file and it should work just fine. So the same thing, we're going to update some panel states and draw panels. This is going to be our kind of our loop that's going to constantly update the panels. And again, those are called in the library and the included header file. So we've got an output. Now there is a light function, the backlight. I did opt to include that in uh, Home Assistant because I'm going to use that to power up and power down my amp based on the state of the backlight. So notice this does have a name, so it is going to show up in a, in a Home Assistant. Okay, so let's take a look at the actual touchscreen itself. And there's some calibration information in here that you might need to change on yours, but it worked perfectly fine for mine right out of the box. But the big part of this is the automation that we're going to run when the panel is touched. And while it might look a little bit overwhelming, especially if you're not familiar with C++ or Arduino code, it's really not that difficult and it is described in much more detail in the written guide so you can modify it for your own needs. But we'll take a quick little overview here. The first thing this is going to do is it's going to check to see if a panel has been touched and if that panel is labeled as touchable. If we're touching an area of the screen that isn't defined as touchable, we're not going to do anything. But if it is, then the first thing we're going to do is we're going to log an ESP home message. This is really handy for troubleshooting. We're just going to show up in the log the coordinates and the name of the panel that we touched. I'll show that in a minute, but it's really not necessary for the functionality. Now, in my case, remember, I'm going to use the state of the backlight of that touch panel to determine whether the amp is powered up or powered down. If it's powered down, I'm going to do something different to power up the amp. In this case, if the amp is already powered up, first thing I'm going to do is check to make sure that I'm not touching one of the menu buttons. If I am touching one of those menu buttons down here, I'm simply going to increment the page number to move the page up or down or back to home. If I've touched one of the other panels, which is really one of my shortcuts, what I'm going to do at this point is I'm actually going to launch and run a Home Assistant script. And again, this is a little bit confusing, but you can see my service call here is just script.turnon, which is what you would normally see in an automation. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a key value pair. This is really kind of the data that you would see underneath that. You would normally give it the name of the script that you want to run. So I'm defining a key value pair with the key being the entity ID and the value I'm actually pulling from the tag that I defined for that panel in my header file. So for example, if the button that I touched was my classic rewind button, it would actually run this script. So here I'm actually going to send that service call to run that script. So that's a lot of information. It's kind of confusing, but again, look at the written guide. It'll describe how to do this and how you can really run any script that you want when you touch a particular panel. Now, the last thing I'll show here is I talked about the backlight being off. In my case, which I'll show you in a minute, I want to be able to touch that panel if it's off and I want to wake up the amp. So what I'm really doing here is again, I'm just calling a script if the panel is off to power up the amp, which will in turn turn on the backlight of the display. So that's it for the ESP home file. So let's take a look at how all this works by doing a live demo. So before we take a look at the live demo, let's take a look at the ESP home logs, because as I mentioned, this can be really handy to help you troubleshoot and when you're initially laying out your panels. So I'll go over here. This is my live system here. I'm going to pull up the logs on that. We'll let that load up here, which takes just a second. Okay, now every time I touch a button, notice that it's going to log in here my XY coordinates and the actual button that I touched. So I can play around and try my different buttons and it's going to tell me exactly which panel that I pressed and exactly what script or the name of the button is going to run. So I just mentioned that because it is really handy when you're first setting up and troubleshooting. Now there is one other thing worth mentioning here. Anytime you make a change to that header file or that .h file, which you're probably going to do a lot when you're initially kind of laying out your panels, you must clean your build files before you do an upload to your ESP32. 
Now to do that, it's very simple to do. We click the three buttons on here and we just click clean build files. It just takes a second to run, but what that will do will force ESP Home to do a full recompile and make sure that it includes any of the changes in your H files. So if you're making changes to your H file and you're uploading to the ESP32 and you're not seeing your changes, make sure that you've run a clean build files before you do your upload. All right, let's take a look at the final finished product. Okay, let's take a look at how all this works. If you remember in the automation in ESP Home, I was testing to whether the backlight on the display was off or on. That lets me know whether the amp is in standby mode or not. So if it is in standby mode, when I touch the display, I simply want it to wake up the amp and turn off the backlight. So I will just simply touch that. You can see that the amp is powering on and now my backlight is on. So that part works just fine. Now I'm going to use a little stylus here. It works fine with your fingers, but I'm just going to try to keep the camera from going crazy. So again, here are my menu buttons along the side. I can simply touch one of those to scroll through my different pages and back to my home page. But when I scroll to a particular page and now I want to actually play a Sirius XM station, all I've got to do is tap that station. It's going to run the Home Assistant script, tell the Sirius XM streaming service to play that station directly to the amp. And changing station is just as simple as touching another button. And you can see here on the amp that it is switching stations and then playing the new station. Then when I'm done listening to music for the day, I can go back to my home page and I have the option to either just stop the music. Or if I'm really done for the day, I can put everything into standby mode, which once again is going to power down the amp and turn off the backlight. So it gives me a really convenient way to finally be able to stream Sirius XM music directly to the amp using my local server and this dedicated device so I don't have to use my phone or go to a Home Assistant dashboard or a website to change Sirius XM stations. So that's pretty much going to wrap up this project. Now, while I understand it's probably very unlikely you're going to exactly replicate this project unless you've also built the same amp that I've got, my goal here was to give you some ideas, maybe some ideas on how to create your own local music streaming service, or maybe adding some kind of touch panel display to Home Assistant where you can show entities, even control entities, or run custom scripts. If you did see anything in this video that you like, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. That lets me and YouTube know more people ought to see this video. Click that subscribe button to see more of my content and ding that little bell icon if you want to be notified when I release new videos. And as always, I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.